reporting. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm Stan Morris, and here's the rundown of the news we're working on today. And we're just about to tell you about a Walnut Ridge school threat had Lawrence County really up in arms today. And we'll tell you more about that in just a second. It ended up being nothing big, thankfully, uh, but it did cause some concern for parents there. A dicamba ban has happened by the Plant Board of Arkansas State, and that is something we're going to be discussing more here in just a short time. There's an AMMC drill in Paragould tonight at 6 o'clock, and it's actually an active shooter drill. We always like to let people know when these happen uh, beforehand so that you know what's going on uh, if there's ever any kind of panic or situation. Also want to let you know more cold weather's coming in, and yeah, it's nasty. We're going to be telling you about that here in just a short time. Um, a case of shoplifting at the mall where a young lady did not want to cooperate with officers, and apparently it wasn't the first time uh, that they have run into her. We'll tell you more about that. We've also got big news from Williams Baptist College where over the weekend they dedicated a new uh, location to somebody that's very important to everyone there. We'll talk about that. A-State business students did something incredible. They did something nobody's ever done before. What is it? You'll know in a minute. Walnut Ridge had a stabbing incident we're just now learning about from late October. That would have been higher up in the rundown, except it's actually kind of old news that's just come out. Um, and we have a special tonight on the Shady Grove situation. Have you heard about this? You've probably read the newspaper and seen the opinion pieces. Well, we have District Prosecutor Scott Ellington. He's given us an exclusive interview. We actually taped it on Tuesday here in our studio, the NEA Report Studios, and he is going to to sit down and talk with us extensively about the Shady Grove situation beginning to end uh, from the beginning of what caused the investigation to why that he didn't pursue charges and we're even going to ask him a little bit about these opinion pieces that you might have seen that are popping up in the Jonesboro Sun. So we'll talk about that all today here on the broadcast. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. And we actually have some national news we're going to be telling you about after we finish our local news, too. Some crazy more uh, crazy sexual harassment stories. More of them are coming out. Another celebrity has been hit with a major set, not one, a set of five allegations. Also, a new name in the Republican Party could be dealing with with his own set of allegations. We'll talk about that coming up in a big deal on Twitter as well. That's all coming up right here on NEA Report. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Stan Morris, and yesterday was our very first broadcast. And it went very well. We want to thank all of you for uh, tuning in and sharing, liking, and, of course, telling your friends, because having news in the palm of your hand at 4 o'clock every day, that can never be bad, right? So our top story we're going to get to right now, a juvenile is in custody for a school shooting threat that was made in Lawrence County. The Walnut Ridge Police Department released this statement. It was actually released this morning on their Facebook page, uh, but we had been getting contacts about it all night. They call it a sick joke, but it was no joke to authorities, especially in the environment that we're dealing with now in the world. A juvenile was put into custody uh, for making a school shooting threat. Now, we can't exactly tell you much about this because with it being an underage uh, you know an underage suspect there's not much that we can tell you as far as his name goes uh, but we know that the statement uh, from my discussion with the Walnut Ridge police chief was something that was not it wasn't like a, a publicly made statement or at least it wasn't initially but then it got out that way and that's when the situation really uh, it just went completely south from there um, the suspect as we mentioned the young man was in custody there was never any threat uh, to the schools or anything like that according to authorities and obviously security was heightened uh, but you can't make threats like that these days so uh, just uh, uh, one of those situations a hard lesson learned for a young man or at least we hope it's a lesson learned You've heard a lot about dicamba, right? I'm sure you have. It's one of the big talks. It's on the front page of the paper today. And uh, actually, our friend George Jarrett at Talk Business did a story about it. If you didn't know, the headline is that the Arkansas State Plant Board voted to ban dicamba use after April 15th. That was during a meeting uh, last night, a public hearing and board meeting. And uh, dicamba in Arkansas uh, during the bulk of the 2018 growing season is going to be banned based on that vote. The dicamba is used to kill weeds, especially pigweed in row crops. Uh, it's also used in soybean and cotton production, just, you know, the heart of the economy here in Arkansas, especially in the Delta. Um, 
Also, Arkansas farmers have planted uh, 3.7 million soybean acres this year. To give you an idea, it's the 11th largest soybean producing state to give you an idea of uh, what an impact uh, this, this type of news has in our area. Uh, the changes will prohibit the use of the herbicide in Arkansas between April 16th and October 31st. The regulations will include uh, exemptions for the use of dicamban pastures, rangeland, turf, uh, ornamental, uh, direct injection for forestry and home use. Uh, so if you want to find out more about that, our buddy George Jared did a great story. It is on Talk Business. You can check that out. We actually shared the link on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash NEA report. Oh, you're, you're there already. Unless you're watching this after the fact, after we taped it, and then you don't know what I'm talking about. But go to our Facebook page if you uh, want to find out more about that story. We told you about this. It's happening tonight at an AMMC active shooter drill is going to be going on. It's something that the Office of Emergency Management, Paragool Police, Fire Departments, Green County Sheriff's Department, Rescue Squad, AIRIVAC, AMMC Ambulance Service, they're all participating in this drill this evening. All entities involved will continue to operate as normal. So if you have to call 911 or the fire department or go to the hospital, they're still going to be obviously providing their normal services. Uh, but there's something that, that every time that there's a situation where there's a drill going on or practice, it could cause a kind of uh, panic in some people if what is, uh, what's taking place is not something you're made aware of ahead of time. That starts at 6 o'clock tonight. That's at AMMC. And uh, we do want to remind everybody, again, it's just a drill. No, no seriousness is taking place. There is some seriousness taking place in the weather, specifically cold. It's getting really cold. Uh, it feels like, well, just yesterday I was reading this forecast off to you. Today, as I go in to, to put in the new numbers, somehow we had a, a 10 degree drop for the expectation on Friday. Now, I'm wondering if the National Weather Service made a little bit of a typo. I put the number in like that they, they put it online, uh, but I'm going to, I don't know. We're just going to show you the forecast, and we're going to tell you uh, it's going to be cold. Uh, we're let me tell you what I'm talking about. First, let's get to tonight's weather, a low of 34. You're going to have to get the pets in tonight. It's really going to be cold. Tomorrow, a high of 50, but sunny skies. Now, the high of 50 tomorrow was said to be 60 yesterday when we had put the numbers in. That was lowered down to uh, down to 50 degrees, and, and we saw that did a double take because tomorrow night's low is going to actually be at freezing. Um, that could be correct. So nonetheless, uh, cold, either way you look at it, and uh, freezing temperatures for a low. Now on Veterans Day, it's going to be mostly sunny and a little bit warmer with a high of 58 and a low of 35. Uh, later into Saturday night, after midnight, there's a rain chance that starts to move in, and it moves in into Sunday with 30% rain chance and a high of 59, a little bit lower, uh, a little bit warmer low. And then on Monday and Tuesday, sunny skies. The high will be around uh, 60 degrees there. Uh, so again, Still cold, maybe a little bit warmer next week, but you're going to have to hit that freezing mark on Friday before you get there. Never good news for anybody. Well, a case of shoplifting ended up being something that was very loud and, and as a matter of fact, uh, probably attracted a lot more attention than it should have. The story is on NEAReport.com. If you've not had a chance to check it out, it, it's really a wild story. An agitated woman went from cursing to exposing her breast, and that's not an exaggeration, to resisting arrest all over the span of just a few minutes during a reported shoplifting call that JPD worked. That was at Dillard's at the mall at Turtle Creek. Um, wild story that just, just repeatedly, it seemed like every chance it could, it got worse. The suspect began with, uh, with some, some wonderful language that she seemed to be uh, treating the officers to that were trying to deal with her, um, but she was not cooperative at any, any point. Now, her name, I'm going to give that to you right now, Mallory R. Jackson, 20 of Wynn. Her mugshot's on the website if you want to see it. A uh, female officer, Officer Caitlin Newby, actually had uh, to respond to the scene to deal with this, this situation. She asked if, if the suspect had any merchandise on her, but that's when Jackson went a little bit mad, uh, according to the report anyway, using a word that we can't say on the air. Well, we could say because it's the Internet, but we're, we have class here. Um, the suspect claimed she tried stuff on but gave it back. She said the only thing she had was a shirt hanging on her arm and insisted she had nothing on her, but the search that the officer would perform a short time later gave some different results. 
uh, yeah, the officer asked her to step around the corner. That's when she pulled her shirt up and exposed her breast, according to the report. The officer told her, cover up right now. And uh, it went from bad to worse there. The suspect, uh, she was searched and then became irate during the time when the officers were in the security room reviewing footage. The suspect, uh, Jackson, Mallory Jackson, had to actually be restrained physically by officers at that point. Um, a male officer and a female officer both trying to restrain her and the whole time, according to the officer that wrote the report, uh, the suspect was resisting. Um, it actually eventually happened where they got her in the police car, took her to Craighead County Detention Center, and the woman got sick uh, where she arrived there, maybe because of the struggle. During the jail search, the standard procedure search that's performed at the detention center, uh, the alleged stolen merchandise was received, placed in an evidence bag. Uh, a white long sleeve shirt was found in the back of the police car, which added an evidence tampering charge in addition to a theft charge, a resisting arrest charge, and an obstructing governmental operations charge, a whole lot of charges that could have been limited to one thing, uh, but went, uh, went repeatedly as the suspect did not appear to want to cooperate with authorities. It's a big honor for somebody in Lawrence County, a significant somebody for the folks at Williams Baptist College, someone that's been there for 50 years of service. Incredible, huh? Actually, longer than that. Jerry D. Gibbons had an atrium dedicated to him over the weekend at Williams Baptist College. He has served the Williams community for over 50 years, the release actually said. On Saturday, it was part of the homecoming celebration to dedicate the new atrium to him. He was all smiles. I've actually got a huge photo of him on the website on NEAReport.com where you can see it quite uh, obviously made his day, uh, and that's very cool. Dr. Kenneth Startup, a longtime Gibbons colleague and incoming interim president at Williams, spoke of the dedication. He called him a master teacher across generations, a mentor to younger faculty, a relentless learner, a formidable uh, academician. That's clearly not the right way to say that. But when you're uh, not the president of the college, I guess it's okay. Uh, but for, they called him serious in his academics, a serious Christian, and a legacy that will be uh, remembered for many, many years to come. Gibbons was joined by his wife, Barbara, and family members during the dedication ceremony. Williams Baptist College, uh, by the way, will become Williams Baptist University in July of 2018. So we want to get everybody ready for that when we start calling it Williams Baptist University, the uh, newest university here in our lovely natural state. Speaking of Arkansas State, some students at Arkansas State University, they did some big achievements and we're going to tell you about those right now. Students finished, and this is the headline that was sent along to us, a -State students finished high in the Bowersox Supply Chain Challenge. Uh, specifically, they finished the uh, highest finish ever in the ninth annual event. The Bowersox Supply Chain Challenge is hosted by Michigan State University. It's one of those uh, business, um, it's, it's like a business project where students get together uh, such as the students from Arkansas State's Global Supply Chain Management Program, and they work together with uh, preparing for the competition. A lot of stuff goes into it. Uh, it encompasses planning and management of activities involved in the flow of products and services and finances, getting these minds ready for business, in other words, uh, and they did really well, so we offer a big congratulations to them. We just learned of a stabbing in Walnut Ridge uh, late yesterday, we learned of it, but it happened at the end of October. The story is that officers approached the residents uh, of the suspected crime, of the crime that is alleged, and we're going to tell you all about that uh, because uh, just a wild story. It ended with one man in jail and another individual uh, was actually, he was not named, but uh, as the investigation is ongoing. According to, uh, to police, they will wait to release his name. Now, the story itself, it's wild. It begins uh, where police were actually called, again, as we mentioned, on October 25th. It was late October. They were called to 523 Southwest 5th Street in reference to this alleged stabbing. But when they got there, uh, they met with an individual who called 911 but they had trouble finding the victim. So I guess it was a different person. And uh, the victim apparently had fled to try to get to Lawrence Memorial Hospital to get medical treatment for five stab wounds. Officers were told Jesse Lundry, 26, had stabbed another subject who lived in the residence. Uh, as we mentioned, his name was not released. But when officers got to the residence, they noticed blood 
a trail of blood on the floor through the doorway. After making entry, officers located and apprehended Lundry, uh, but they didn't find the victim, as we mentioned why before. The victim was later taken to St. Bernard's Medical Center. Um, he was last listed in stable condition, but he see, uh, continues to receive serious medical treatment. That is, a, that is a serious situation. And Lundry, meanwhile, is being held at the Lawrence County Detention Center on a $50,000 cash-only bond. He's formally charged, uh, or he's formally facing a charge of a Class Y felony first-degree battery. His plea arraignment date is set for December 13th at the Lawrence County Courthouse. More news coming up in just a few minutes, so hang tight with us. We've also got a big interview that we're going to be airing tonight with District Prosecutor Scott Ellington, who's going to talk to us about the Shady Grove investigation and why no charges were ever presented in that. Plus, we'll talk to him about the whole thing, beginning to end. I mean, if you haven't heard the story yet, we'll tell you everything you need to know about it. That's coming up on NEA Report. Hang tight. If you're a business owner, gaining new customers and retaining them is your top priority and biggest hurdle. Today, 85% of customers search online or look for you on social media. Do you have an effective strategy to reach them? At Ace One, we will customize a digital marketing strategy comprising of social media, web and video marketing that fits your budget. Our dedicated account managers will work with you to create engaging campaigns covering all digital media outlets. Ace One, your partner in digital marketing. Contact us today. Welcome back. And we're sitting here with District Prosecuting Attorney Scott Ellington. Thank you hey, so Stan. much. Well, thanks for having me, Stan. Sure. And you've been in the news a whole bunch lately, especially in the Jonesboro Sun. Um, today, I want to talk to you about the Shady Grove um, right. situation. Specifically, there's been uh, an investigation, and it's, it's now, I guess, it's not going to go to charges. So catch us up from the beginning. Where did this all begin, and, and what's for those who don't know, okay. what happened? So, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, it came to my attention that uh, there were uh, citizens in the uh, Shady Grove area township of Greene County. Uh, and, and for folks that don't understand where the Shady Grove air, uh, township, what's most important is that uh, between Bono and Sedwick, Bono's in Craighead County, Sedwick is in Lawrence County. Okay. And there is a little uh, sliver of Greene County that crosses the four lane there. Right. Uh, right down where that Murphy Oil Depot is. And so um, the, the, uh, some folks put in a liquor store there mm -hmm. because uh, several years ago that, that township was dry for many years. Uh, they uh, got circulated petitions, had a vote, and it went wet. And it was wet, so they, uh, Don Nicholas built uh, a, a, a store called the, I think it's the Little Country Store, and um, he started selling beer, uh, hence that's why he had, had the vote of wet. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, ongoing for a couple of years. And then uh, after that, last year, uh, another individual circulated a petition to try to turn this township back dry. Going back which would make uh, the sale of uh, beer and wine illegal in the liquor or in the, in the country store. So uh, Bob Hester, a local uh, activist, circulated the petition, uh, got it on the ballot in Greene County. So uh, it came to my attention that by an article in the local newspaper that, uh, that there were uh, uh, some trailers and, and, and camper trailers essentially had been moved in behind that country store. Mm -hmm. And uh, folks were claiming that as residents for, uh, so they could register to vote in that township. Uh, that uh, caused me great concern. And uh, so at that point, I called and asked for a state police investigation. The state police uh, uh, then stepped in, assigned a special agent to uh, begin the investigation. And as he did, uh, he made contact with those folks who had registered to vote uh, using that area as their uh, as their address. And uh, a, a few others listed another area where there was some new construction as their address. But uh, we, we began kind of focusing on those individuals. Uh, as his investigation went on, um, he pulled uh, the voter registration cards, he looked at them, he pulled other items and, and reviewed them. Uh, we were in contact 
uh, throughout his investigation, uh, it, it seemed like weekly, during a, a great period of that time. And uh, now this was not his only investigation, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, he also was assigned to other investigations. He is actually assigned out of Little Rock. So he had other investigations that were assigned to him besides the Shady Grove voter uh, fraud issue. So uh, as, as we went on, uh, we weren't making a lot of headway. I issued prosecutor subpoenas to 21 individuals, which means that I asked them to come in and uh, give a statement so that I could question them about uh, uh, their residency and things like that. He, he would be there with me to assist in the, in the uh, questioning because uh, he would then be the one to uh, offer testimony if they make statements uh, against interest and such as that. Uh, each of those folks that he, I gave the subpoenas to him, he served them. Each of them that came back, um, uh, came in, they uh, invoked their right to counsel. Mm -hmm. And uh, because when we bring them in under prosecutor's subpoena, we have to uh, tell them that, you know, advise them they have a right to remain silent. Anything they say can and will be used against them. The, 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 the Miranda right Miranda. that you see on TV all the sure. time. Sure. And uh, they appeared uh, with an attorney and invoked their right to counsel and, and their Fifth Amendment right not to say anything. And so we didn't have, uh, we didn't have statements against interest from any of those individuals. Uh, we did have statements against interest, uh, statements by two individuals that uh, were, when the officer was actually serving uh, the subpoenas and making, or in, during his investigation, uh, two, fem two women uh, that, had, that worked at the store um, did make statements uh, that uh, uh, they had changed their admitted that they've changed their voter registration there and that they were not residing there. However, one of them, Ms. Hibbard, uh, she did say that they that they stayed um, in a trailer out there when uh, when they worked late. Uh, it, it was routine for them to stay in one of the trailers uh, out behind the, the place. They ran an extension cord and actually did uh, uh, have a uh, sleep out there and stay out there uh, after they'd work long hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was one. Another one was a young lady that lived with her parents. Um, there were, was a statement by her in the investigation there that uh, she had been encouraged to put the store as her address. And then she, once her name appeared in the newspaper, she quit. Uh, there was conflicting information that, in fact, uh, since she lived with her parents a, a ways away, whether or not she was going to, you know, spend the night in any of those trailers, that was an issue uh, that that was not resolved uh, totally, and certainly to, uh, to sufficient enough to to just uh, have that as concrete evidence of uh, of her uh, violating the the voter laws. Uh, back to the Hibbard uh, statement, Mr. Hibbard, uh, uh, the the girl's husband. Uh, he had said that he had actually called the Secretary of State's office and had conversations with them mm -hmm. about uh, residency requirements and where where who could where they could claim as their domicile or their resident uh, for voting practices, and so there was uh, discussion about that as well. But then when we brought them in for the prosecutor subpoena, um, uh, they all of them asserted their right to uh, to not uh, uh, give a statement and clarify or. Uh, and, make any further statements about that situation. After reviewing the case file, after uh, uh, consulting with um, the investigator, uh, it seemed to me that uh, there was um, some evidence uh, of, uh, of, of a willingness to commit voter fraud. Uh, however, with, uh, with regard to that, the, the two best cases were against two individuals who it appeared to be uh, uh, very insignificant players in, uh, in this whole operation. Okay. Uh, so I took it then after, after consulting with my investigator, I decided that at this point we would um, ish, do a letter, uh, it's, it's a warning letter, saying that I believe you violated the law uh, I think there's evidence there of that, um, and but but 
in this particular case, uh, we're not going to move forward. And that, that, that they I basically told them, do not, you know, be aware that if you do this again, you're subject to prosecution. There's not going to be as many um, second chances. That's right. Okay. So uh, in, in, in issuing that letter, uh, I uh, was, uh, one, trying to communicate that we 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 think we we're pretty sure we know what you did yeah um but i and i did not concede as much that we would uh that, that we did not have sufficient evidence but i thought that we uh, uh we had a good uh, uh effort to uh, at least try to discourage similar bad conduct now do you feel like whenever you you're looking back, and there's probably what 70 or 80 voters or registered voters in that's the right. township. That's right. So when you're talking about maybe there's 15 or 20 changes in that, that could be a huge dynamic to the voter base. Well, it could be. Yeah. It, it, yes, it was. You know, in fact, the uh, the the effort to make the uh, Shady Grove Township dry mm -hmm. uh, failed, and uh, there of uh, uh, this hit the newspaper before the actual vote before right. election day right and so then the effort to um or though most of those folks did not vote in the election in the election only four of those folks voted and they voted in the early uh, uh as early ballot early and absentee ballot type so they probably process. already voted so they had voted uh before it came out in the newspaper i see and nobody else and cast their ballot once it was no one there. else cast their ballot once it was out there okay. so uh the the effort failed i mean the the effort to to make it dry failed right it remained wet and uh that was by a margin of 12 votes uh if we assume and we don't know how those four people voted but if we assume that they voted uh, against the effort at, to keep it um uh, to keep it wet then that would still be that the uh the it passed by eight votes mm -hmm. and that doesn't sound like a lot except when you're considering um that it was uh, it's a total voter base of about 70 folks yes and then eight's more than 10 percent of that uh, and of four that. is 50 percent of that eight so, so you have yeah. a 50 percent potential so I, I get how um I, I, you know, the numbers are important, even though they sound like sure. just a handful of people. I think we kind of established that, you know, uh, that there are importances there, even if it's just a few. So you, you basically, once it came to the point where you're interviewing people and they invoke right. their rights to stay silent and, and to not self-incriminate, uh, are you at that point, are you just not able to really move any direction with a case where you can get enough to try them with? How does that work? All right. So, uh, you know, in any case, uh, we can, uh, uh we have cases where we prove if somebody does, I mean, if they make an admission, mm -hmm. uh, obviously we use that against them because we told them we would. Sure. Uh, and, and if they, uh, especially if they, after they've been uh, Mirandized and read their rights by law enforcement, which is either the investigator or the prosecutor, we, we do that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, we, we make many cases when people don't invoke or don't make statements but we have, uh, uh, if we catch somebody with stolen property in their possession, well, we can charge them with possessing the stolen property. Sure. Uh, if we catch them, if we have a videotape of someone robbing a store, we can still prosecute them for that without them making a statement. However, when you're when you get into uh, some of these more uh, uh, that. that, that a, a, a kind of like a white collar crime or something mm -hmm. it, it's it's uh, it's less uh it's not as easy uh in this particular case and uh you know in this particular case i, I there there are two uh, local issues two local cases that weighed into um my consideration and uh they were uh, uh, one is the uh, is the arkansas supreme court case that is a uh, it's a state v jernigan or jernigan v state mm -hmm. and that's uh where a an individual who ran and was elected mayor in one of our towns in the in the second judicial district uh there was a contest about his uh eligibility and to run or to be to serve as mayor because uh the allegations were that he didn't really live in the uh in the city where he was elected mayor and the law is pretty specific about that 
So uh, that was contested by uh, one of my deputy prosecutors and uh, a local judge, a circuit judge, heard the evidence and actually ruled that he met the residency requirements. In that, uh, the fact pattern that's, that's recited in that uh, Arkansas Supreme Court case, uh, the man rented a room from another individual uh, to be his residence inside the city. Uh, he had a, a, a cot or a couch that he would be his, where he slept. He did not have a shower. He did not have uh, a bathroom as such in there. Uh, and so he paid a dollar a night or $5 a week for the time period. And that's what he claimed as his residence. And um, so then the, the Arkansas Supreme Court upheld that and said that, uh, you know, on, on that set, scant set of facts, uh, if that, that, that he could remain as the uh, uh, mayor of that town. And, and I, one of the, I brought a case, you know, you and I talked about this before, mm -hmm. and I brought the case with me uh, just, to, just to give you a quote. And this is what, uh, what we rely on. It says, uh, the Supreme Court says, we take this opportunity to clarify the statement as it appears to have caused much confusion. A better statement of the law is that in determining residency of voters and public officials, this court has considered, one, whether a person was physically present in a particular location, or two, whether a person intended to establish a domicile in a particular location. In other words, if the candidate was unable to establish residency by showing physical presence in the requisite location, this court has allowed a candidate to establish residency by showing intent. 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 That's a pretty, so, I mean, that's, that's very uh, so liberal, if you will. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it, 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 it's not very narrow. Right. So we bring uh, charges against 21 individuals and charge them with, uh, uh, with violating the voter registration laws and, and allege that they filed false um, uh, uh, affidavits or applications to change their voter registration. Mm -hmm. And if we, do, if we did that and then they say, well, we intended to make that our, our residence, we intended to stay there, and we carried forward with that, you know, then that, that leaves a big hole in the case. So my, my layman's understanding sure. of this, it sounds to me like that, and you correct me as I'm wrong here, but it sounds to me like that you understood that there was something going on here and that people clearly had intentions to maybe surreptitiously operate with, with a few voting methods, but then uh, it, was, it was shut down as far as the report goes and it stopped. At that point, you looked into it in terms of an investigation. Is there something criminal here, and is there a prosecuting uh, A prosecutable standard? offense or standard. Right, right, right. Is there something I can do? And so then you, you show me this Supreme Court case, and it pretty much says, hey, if you pretend you live there, you live there. Right. I know that's not exactly what it says, but it's very much broad. It's very a liberal interpretation of where somebody's living. Is that the standard that you had to beat or meet? That it is. Uh, you know that that would be the standard that the defendants would go forward and ask the court to dismiss the charges based upon that. And they would. I, you, they did not give us a statement in the prosecutor when we issued prosecutor subpoenas. Sure. But I, I'm I'm relatively sure that they would have said uh, we intend to do that. Uh, it, to, we intended to make this place at least our, where we intend to live during a period of time. Now, they, then they could say, well, we, we saw that in the paper, and we changed our mind, but at the time we registered to vote, that was our intent. And there's not really, once, once you have that precedent like that, and, and it's brought to a court, what, uh, what can you do? Even, even in a case like this where I would say, looking at it, it might have been a little bit too broad, just common sense-wise. Mm -hmm. It seems like they were probably a little too broad in their interpretation. That's right. I mean, what do you do? Can you take it back up to the Supreme Court, or, or what options do you have? Well, uh, once the Supreme Court issues a, a, an opinion, uh -huh. it would ha I think we would have to have much more substantial um, a case that, than the one that we had here to, uh, uh, to offer a challenge to the actual um, 
law and to try to get this this current opinion overturned. Mm -hmm. And this this I mean this opinion has been cited numerous times in subsequent opinions, and also uh, it, it, it pulled together uh, the opinions from other cases older. So it's you know it's it's established law at this time. I started to say it doesn't seem like you're ever going to be able to prosecute a case for for voter. Well, you know now uh, there there was a there, there a couple other issues that. Uh, we were looking at was uh, the the uh, an untoward act to try to get people to change their votes, mm -hmm. but we didn't get what we felt was a sufficient evidence of of uh, the you know there was there was no money paid to somebody to change their vote. There okay. was no uh, uh, coercion. There was no intimidation. There was no bribery to get them to change. This was uh, people changing their uh, registration of their own free will, mm -hmm. and uh, we we saw no evidence of anyone being coerced or intimidated or paid to uh, to change their uh, voter registration. So I think that's a different. That, that's also an issue that was investigated sure. and that that didn't come to light in in to today. But you just when you brought it up, that's that's something that was also involved in that matter. But but. Those types what would have prompted, I would assume, a different response. It would have. And, and there would, you know, the vast majority of these folks would have been witnesses to a defendant. I see. As opposed to uh, being, uh, uh, being all defendants, potential defendants in the case. You know, and so rather than being the uh, left holding the bag, you know, we would, uh, I think that it's reasonable to think that they would have, uh, been uh, used and given the opportunity to testify in, in a matter had we had that evidence. What kind of punishments would have it, it well would have gone because uh, because they uh, didn't actually cast votes. Yeah. Uh, then we're looking at misdemeanors okay. and uh, had they voted, it would have it, it, it could have you know the four that that voted yeah. um, would be su subject to uh, potential felonies. However, the four that voted. Uh, also, uh, I think I think they're the ones that claim their residence as some new construction out there, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and there's nothing in the law that says that, that says that they after they register to vote that they couldn't change their mind. Uh, you know, uh, people change their mind. You know, sure. I think uh, uh, you know they can go to the, uh, the uh, they can go to a car lot, and uh, somebody wants to think they thinks they've sold somebody a car, uh, but until they sign on the you know dotted line, and then. Uh, actually take possession of the car it's it's not uh, the you know it's not a, a done deal well in, in this case I think that we have uh, people that uh, they could they could say it was their intent now it's a fact question and the jur the judge may say no but uh, in the long run I think this this uh, court opinion pretty well um, guts uh, uh, that case in, in in this particular set of facts. I think we have to give you points for making a car reference based on how close we are to so many dealerships. I yeah, you I know, feel like that was pretty <laughs> topical. It, 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 there are uh, there's a lot of car dealerships in this in this city. Uh, um, indeed, and close to us in our studio here. So now this has been covered almost incessantly by the Jonesboro Sun. Um, I, I've seen, and I'm not just talking about with with the news articles, but but specifically. Um, there have been opinion pieces, and um, and in essence, the gist of it is that you're not doing enough. That's that's, that's the essence of the opinion pieces. How do you how do you respond to that well, sentiment? Uh, you know, I do my job, and and I, I, I try to do my job well, and I try to to do uh, the right thing. And uh, it, the day I begin uh, trying to make decisions based on what I think uh, uh, the media, how the media is going to react to something as opposed to what's, what's the right thing to do uh, is then is the day that, you know, I need to do something else. So uh, I take my lumps and will take my lumps. I think that uh, most of what I hear or, or have you know uh, that 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 is the concern by people that um, that that don't agree with this decision mm -hmm. uh, is that I think that 
on when when one looks at a basic set of facts, and, and I did too. Mm -hmm. I issued the investigation. Mm -hmm. But then when you apply the law, and we, when you apply the rules of evidence, and when you apply the things that lawyers have to do in presenting a case to a, a, a fact finder, whether that's a judge or a jury, that uh, a lot of times uh, people are not, it seems black and white. And, 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 and so many things seem black and white. And I've had conversations with with uh, other folks about other cases, they seem black and white. Mm -hmm. But then, when you uh, you know when you get to the point of presenting it to the fact finder in court, we have the rules of evidence that apply. Which uh, you've been in the courtroom uh, with uh, observing cases, and you know that there are a lot of arguments that go on for hours sometimes over whether a piece of evidence could be admitted or not. Sure. And uh, the days. other, <laughs> yes, yeah. and and a lot of research. And in this case, you know, it it seems real easy to say, well, this person made this statement or admission, but there's a rule of law that says, uh, and procedure that says, uh, you cannot use a co-defendant statement against a, a co-defendant, one statement against a co-defendant, to prove that co-defendant's guilt alone. You have to have other evidence uh, to, that, oh. that would that would substantiate the the violation of the crime and uh, the the uh, intent. So you basically have to prove it without the co-defendant statement, and then apply that as as to to bolster keeps somebody from rolling over on a friend to try to get out of trouble. Well, that that is uh, you know it happens, but uh, uh, but it doesn't. I mean, but if we can't prove that the second person was the, the, the new defendant was involved, mm -hmm. the one who made the statement, we can't use their statement against them until we've proven that they were involved. And then we can show just how deep in they were involved in the case. I see. So well, we have to prove it independently before the co-defendant statement comes in. Do you find it? And I know that I'm asking this question because this is a, a world that I operate in too. Do you find it sometimes frustrating where your body of work is on the, uh, on the public platform for critique. I mean, is it is it one of those situations where Monday morning quarterbacking kind of happens sometimes? Or it, you know? well, it does. I mean, I think it, it's. I think there's uh, uh, there are questions that that uh, the lay public uh, has about uh, issues that, that if they're not familiar with the rules of evidence and, and the rules of criminal procedure or civil procedure, but we deal with criminal in the prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. But I think that, yes, there, there's, uh, it, it seems so black and white until it starts being parsed down and prepared for court. And that's, unfortunately, defense lawyer, uh, lawyers in general get involved. That's just the way it happens. And, you know, uh, we know that there would be defense counsel involved in this, and they would be uh, challenging every a bit of evidence, and we also know that, uh, you know, if I know, regardless of that, here's, you know, if I know that it's it's what we can't prove, mm -hmm. then I'm not going to bring charges just to bring charges. And uh, that, you know, I have, uh, uh, I tell people that when, you know, Police officers uh, make arrests routinely, and they have uh, what's called a, a probable cause. You've heard that term. I have. And probable cause is uh, where they believe the facts are sufficient that the crime was committed and this person did it to get a to, to get a judge to sign a warrant or to prove uh, to approve a, a, a warrantless arrest and to hold some, bind somebody over. But uh, the in the in the case of prosecuting somebody, uh, uh, then we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they in fact did that. It's a lot different than probable cause. It's much different than probable cause. Uh, probable cause is something probably something less than fifty percent. And beyond a reasonable doubt is more like above eighty five, ninety percent, isn't it? Or, or more than that, or more. probably. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I think. 
you know, in jury terms, we try not to quantify by numbers, but right. just just so folks can understand, it's set somewhere between ninety five and ninety nine point nine percent, somewhere in there, very high up. And and a, to throw it even further, a, another monkey wrench in there. Uh, civil trials are only preponderance of the evidence. That's right, and not that ninety eight percent. It's it's fifty one percent, isn't that right? That, that that would be you know if I was giving it a number, and we don't, try not to, but I'd right. say fifty one percent is. By preponderance, more likely than not that it happened. That's a civil trial. Uh, there are other. There's a. You know, there are other uh, uh, standards, uh, clear and convincing, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the the judge must find that uh, something happened by a, or must find by clear and convincing evidence that this occurred to do this. And so those th those are different levels apply to different types of cases. Well, you've helped us. We like to break things down and simplify it because that helps me to figure out what's going well, on. Well, and what I, where I was getting with, at with all that mm -hmm. is officers make arrests and then we see the facts, we get the police file together. We, uh, many times, we we begin the prosecution because of, uh, of, of that, uh, that, that there's already an arrest made, the court's been, has found probable cause, mm -hmm. and we go forward with that. And we may or may not uh, proceed to trial, but uh, in 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 a case where our office is doing the investigation, I think we're duty bound to believe that that we've got sufficient evidence to get a conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not our job to just file charges and have someone charged and, and then throw it up against the wall if we don't think that we're going to get a conviction or if we think that the law is contrary. Is is that justice? I mean, is it, would it be justice? If if uh, if you had a heavy-handed person that was willing to just throw it up against the wall or charge people that they may think that they're they don't have enough money to hire a lawyer and, and or their uh, their the lawyer they have is maybe not as aggressive or maybe practices a certain type of uh, uh, a certain area of law not the criminal aspect and 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 is not as well tuned to some others so no it, it, it's it's not that. Uh, I believe that it's our duty to only charge those cases where, uh, if what if we're handling the investigation, mm -hmm. uh, if we're in charge, if we've been charged with the investigation and make the decision to start with, that we we have to have uh, an abiding uh, a belief that there's guilt and that we have a path to conviction, not you know. It, it, it and maybe it's not overwhelmingly broad path to conviction, but we have to we have to believe that we have a way uh, before we get there, or we we regroup and we continue the investigation. Was that Supreme Court decision the reason that you didn't have a path forward? If you could, yes, I mean, one the, thing? I think you boil it down to the intent. Folks could claim that as you know those trailers is their intent. Uh, I think that uh, just the. Uh, uh, Without statements involving that, you have, and, and I was concerned. I mean, I will, once we saw it, it was enough for me to call in the investigator. Of course. So I think that you've, that, that is the pathway where, or that is the roadblock that causes us to, uh, to not have that uh, conviction in all but uh, one or two of those cases, but then, you know, I think that there are some people that would be happy with uh, with one or two convictions and and uh, you know go forward, but then there's some question. I mean, the one that said uh, uh, that they that that said we didn't live here, but we stayed in that trailer. I think that once uh, that person got to the in front of a jury or a fact finder and had their lawyer on board, I think that there might be some clarification of what we didn't live there but we intended to or we you know i i, I anticipate that there could be some of that uh, even with some of the statements left well they were the you know they were not they were not recorded okay they were uh they were spontaneous statements when the investigator went out and and delivered the subpoenas I see. and so uh you you know it's better it had had we had that those statements made when we had the prosecutor subpoena when we had a video and audio recording set up for them to make, you know, to to to, to record those, mm -hmm. that's that's so much more uh, uh, solid to present because 
it would be easy for, and, and there's a very good investigator from Little Rock that came in and handled this, but I'm, I think that there's always some question as to, there, there would be issues for them to make arguments against, well, he wrote that down wrong, or, or he, he, you know, he's mischaracterizing what I said. Sure. And so um, it would be, uh, I don't see a reason, didn't see a reason, especially if we weren't going to get to charge the ones that we thought were uh, um, kind of the, 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 the ones who started all this. Right. Um, so at that point, I didn't, uh, I thought that a warning letter to all involved would, uh, would be an appropriate way to resolve this case in this particular set of facts. Um, last question, uh, at least that I can think of until I can think of another one. Um, we're dealing with a time where we're hearing a lot about voter fraud in the national media. Do you think that happens a lot? Um, I think it happens. I think it, I think that there are, uh, uh, but I don't, don't know that, uh, I think that absentee balloting, uh, is, is a concern in some areas in this state where, um, uh, an elderly person is uh, uh, is homebound, and that ballot is mailed to their home, yeah. and then someone else casts that ballot uh, as they wish to do so, rather than as without the elderly person or the incapacitated person having the option or even the knowledge of whom uh, was being voted for. Mm -hmm. We've seen some of that, and 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 you know we. I call for a prosecutor uh, or for an investigation over in uh, uh, East Arkansas in, in Crittenden County, and it resulted in um, uh, uh, several uh, convictions and um, arrests and convictions, and and that was in a, a previous state rep race over there, and uh, so it's not like I'm unfamiliar with doing that. Right. Uh, you know, a couple of folks ended up catching federal time. Uh, a couple other, or I think three or four other folks caught state time and uh, in that, and you remember that was the one where they were um, uh, maybe chicken dinners and half pints were being, you know, being dispersed for uh, some of the, the uh, uh, votes that were gathered in. Right. And uh, so uh, it, those are issues involved in that. I see. Well, Scott Ellington, thank you so much for coming in the thank studio. You. Thank you, Thank you, guest. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Take care. More news coming up. Back live here with you on NEA Report. Thanks a lot, everybody, for hanging out with us as we wanted to bring that one to you. Very important interview there with a lot of big implications. Weather is going to be nasty in terms of how cold it's going to be over the next couple of days for our lows tonight. Mostly clear and low of 34. Tomorrow, sunny with a high near 50 and a low around 32. And then on Veterans Day, mostly sunny with a high of 58 and a low of 35. A slight temperature increase as we move into next week. It's not on the forecast, but by next Wednesday, rain showers are going to be moving in. We're going to see uh, across the area. So get ready for that. Uh, that is on the way next week cool temperatures too so just getting ready to uh to report a story here and actually we have some breaking news to bring along to you right now this just came in got a report that the gilmore and marion fire department is working a residential structure fire in the 200 block of eureka in turrell that's just a short uh, time ago that that just came in. That is breaking news uh, on the NEA report. We're with you live right now as that just happened. Some stories we wanted to bring you on the national scene um, with some major implications. I just can't believe what I'm reading here. It seems like every day that goes by, there's another set of stories involving sexual harassment. Well, it's happened once again. In fact, today we have two names to tell you about. The first report that we're going to get to is the, uh, it's actually from a name that's been on the national scene a lot more lately. You may not have even heard it before this year, but the name you've heard of probably this year at least is Roy Moore. The Washington Post is reporting that four women have come forward to allege that the former Alabama judge who was twice removed from the state's Supreme Court and is currently the GOP nominee for Senate. These four women stated to the Washington Post that Moore pursued them for sexual relationships when they were young teens. More than one of the women reportedly said he pursued her when she was only 14 years old. I wanted it over with. 
I wanted out. She told the Post of her sexual encounter with Moore. Please, just get this over with. Whatever this is, just get this over with. Crazy story. That's from the Washington Post if you want to read more. And it doesn't stop there with the craziness. Uh, this one just a short time ago, in fact, on, on the DailyBeast.com, the uh, tagline was that the dam is broken, referencing sexual assault, sexual harassment, um, claims and allegations coming forward now. The report says uh, in the New York Times, five women have said that Louis C.K. committed sexual misconduct. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to tell you the story here. The five women in the new, new report by the New York Times said that Louis C.K. committed sexual misconduct in his interactions with them. In some of the cases, the women, fellow comedians, said that he masturbated in front of them or while on the phone with them. He really did it, one woman said in an interview with the Times. Her name, Dana Min Goodman. He proceeded to take all his clothes off, get completely naked, and started masturbating. This is Louis C.K. Now, as some of his comedy material is, is rather risque. I thought the guy is hilarious. Um, it's so disturbing to read this report. The report notes that this is the first time a story has been told on the record after years of rumors and comments from other female comedians. Do you remember how that Seth MacFarlane joked about Harvey Weinstein, about how that he made jokes at award shows about his sexual harassment, and then it later turned out to be that those weren't actually jokes, as Seth MacFarlane even said, but those were uh, his way of, of telling the public of a despicable behavior. It seems like a lot of this stuff is being talked about and discussed as, mm -hmm. as uh, just, just things that happen or things that take place until we've now, kind of, I guess, as a society, reached the point where it's, it's you know, uh, there's, there's a stand that's happening. Um, Louis C.K. Uh, apparently had some type of movie premiere that was scheduled, and that has since uh, been canceled. So that's a story we're going to be following more. This one just came a short time ago from TMZ, reporting that O.J. Simpson is already back in trouble. He just got out of jail. Uh, he, but the report is that he was asked to leave the Cosmopolitan Resort on Wednesday night because he became intoxicated and extremely unruly. Hotel staff told TMZ around midnight, O.J. Simpson, the juice, was drinking too much juice, spike juice. He was drunk and became disruptive at the click bar, the report says. Simpson reportedly was angry at hotel staff and glasses broke at the bar. The website says security shut up and removed Simpson from the hotel. They said that he has, uh, Simpson was nice to security guards, but he has been permanently banned from returning. He's 70 years old now. Got out of prison on October 1st um, after uh, nine years behind bars on a robbery charge. Twitter is pausing account verification after the Daily Beast reported that white nationalists were receiving blue check marks, the verified check marks that Twitter does. Uh, how that happened, we don't know yet, but Twitter announced today it's going to stop that verification process after the report that their uh, social media platform had verified the account of a white supremacist earlier in the week. It's uh, something they quoted, they actually said verification was meant to authenticate identity and voice, but it's interpreted as an endorsement or an indicator of importance, Twitter said in a statement um, in regards to that. Back to local, just for a second here. There's a, a big community event that's coming up that we want to make everybody aware of. It's something in Lawrence County that's happening. It is the Lawrence County Community Thanksgiving. It's going to take place Wednesday, November 22nd at the studio on Main Street from 2 until 6 p.m. There's a story on NEAReport.com about it right now. If you've not read it or you want to find out more information, and if you're on Facebook watching us live, then you actually can go to the event. Uh, there's an event page for it that you can visit and uh, RSVP to that uh, and uh, check it out. It's going to be uh, Wednesday, November 22nd. Everyone is welcome and there is no charge, which is always, you know, that's always pretty nice. 
Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us today. We had a much longer newscast than uh, initially expected, of course, I'm sure, by many. Um, but there was a lot of news to bring you today, and we wanted to bring you that Shady Grove stuff as well. Uh, more news later in the week, of course, tomorrow. Another newscast coming at you Monday through Friday, 4 p.m., right here always. If you want to support NEA Report, you can do it as a viewer. That's right, just as a viewer, and I'm not even asking you for any money. Pretty cool, huh? Just like and share our newscast, and, and it really does help us out a whole lot, if you can believe that. It, uh, it Seriously, the more people that like it, the more of your friends see it, and the more of their friends see it. We're changing the way news is done here in Northeast Arkansas. We're not making you wait until 5 or 6 p.m. to find out what's going on in your world. All you got to do is grab your cell phone and hold it up to your face every day at 4 o'clock right here on NEA Report. I'm Stan Morris. Thanks a lot, everybody, for tuning in today. And